Another half hour of Hatterberg Classics are queued up and ready to roll. So, coming up. The people that objected to it did so because they didn't have enough information to base it on. And like all of us, we form very strong opinions with very little knowledge. But despite opposition, he didn't give up. The result was a massive floodway that has saved Wichita from disaster many times since. It's my story about Big Ditch Mitch from 1993. Also, I've had uh, quite a few people, uh, the wife of a very good friend of mine has said when she comes back in her next life, she wants to come back as Max Falkenstein. Max had the job that a lot of KU sports fans would have killed for. He was the voice of the Jayhawks and a true broadcast icon. Larry caught up with him in his 50th year in the booth. Plus, she was the media mogul of Douglas, Kansas, 21 years old and the owner of the local newspaper. So how did she manage that? Would she succeed? We'll stick around and find out. Hi, everybody. I'm Larry Hedeberg. I'm Susan Peters. Those are just some of Larry's classic stories we're going to show you on this edition of Hedeberg's People. These stories are like old friends. Their lives radiate from the screen like prophets of the past. They were teachers, but not in a classroom. Instead, they taught about life to those around them who cared to listen, and I was their student. Most people are never famous. Some are famous for a period of time and then forgotten. And then there are those whose fame transcends generations. Now those are usually the people who helped somehow change the course of history and left lasting legacies. In the Wichita area, one such person in that category is M.S. Mitchell, also known as Big Ditch Mitch. We feed from 10 to 15 cats that live in the park back out here every evening. It's not the image you would expect from the man who had the nickname Big Ditch Mitch. They'd, they'd have to understand that my wife is, is a cat person and if you're going to live with her, you're going to live with cats. Isn't that right, Alex? In this relaxed Riverside backyard, it's hard to imagine that Mitch Mitchell was once the center of a great controversy. This was the reason the Wichita Valley Center floodway, affectionately known as the Big Ditch. There's a pride of not ownership, but a pride of, of being part of that project that many of us will share as long as we live. Mitch was the lead engineer in the battle to build a floodway, and it seemed like a good idea. Floods in 1904 devastated the area, and later in the 40s and 50s, the water would rise again turning downtown and the Riverside area into an ocean of mud and silt. Since the 50s, the Big Ditch has saved Wichita tens of millions of dollars from damaging floodwaters. Now Mitch is semi-retired, leading a quiet life. And today it's hard for us to imagine that a project that would save Wichita from flooding was fraught with controversy. The main thing was don't let the federal government dictate to you, we can do these things here um, locally. We don't, we don't need the federal government involved. But the truth was, they did. The ditch was talked about in the 30s, but it wasn't finished until 1958. And all the controversy did to Mitch was to make the project more fun. It was a dare. And, and made the work a lot more exciting than, than it would have been otherwise. Now, if you've never stopped to appreciate what the Big Ditch does, think about this. If it hadn't been built, Wichita would be in trouble. I told someone the other day, somewhere between Hillside on the east and Ridge Road on the west, there would be flooding parts of Wichita all the way between those two limits. There are memories here for Mitch, but no grudges against those who thought it was foolishness. The people that objected to it did so because they didn't have enough information to base it on. And like all of us, we form very strong opinions with very little knowledge. And we may be luckier than we know. Mitchell says if the ditch were proposed today, he doubts it would be built. I think it would have failed had it been put, put to the public. So. 
as the big ditch quietly does its job. Folks like Mitch Mitchell see it as a monument to hard work and perseverance. And today, Mitchell is as content as a cat with his life's work. But most of the time, they pretty well. Well, Big Ditch Mitch enjoyed his retirement for another 24 years before passing away in 2017 at age 91. Wichitans are, should be so lucky and should be thanking him forever. Without the Big Ditch, we'd have water in downtown Wichita, we'd have water in Riverside, we'd have water in a lot of places that mm -hmm. we don't even think about now. And it's the Big Ditch that has saved Wichita so and many times. And he had to fight and fight and fight for that. You gotta have some sort of courage to know that your idea is right and fight the pressures that were against the Big Ditch, and, and he did. We are so fortunate to have Big Ditch Mitch uh -huh. in our in history. In fact, it's in wonderful. 2019, Congress passed and President Trump signed legislation officially changing the name of the Big Ditch, which is what we've called it forever, to the M.S. Mitch Mitchell floodway and it is so well deserved it is so We're well so deserved. happy for his existence mm -hmm. all right well now to another man who was a household name to generations of kansans max falkelstein had one of the longest sports casting careers in american history yeah max started by doing radio play-by-play -play for ku football and basketball right after world war ii well, in 1996, I traveled to Lawrence to catch him in action. The world was coming back home again. The faraway wars now over. The men, back to their families, their jobs, and their schools. Hold makes a diving reception just inside the end line. In 1946, like today, Max Falkenstein watched them come back to campus, the gridiron, and the court. In the old, old days, I think guys played at the University of Kansas because for the most part maybe they were from Kansas and uh, wearing Kansas across their jersey had a, had a great significant uh, emotional meaning to them. This crowd has been electrified by that play. For 50 years, Falkenstein has been the man behind the microphone at the University of Kansas football and basketball games. I've had uh, quite a few people, uh, the wife of a very good friend of mine has said when she comes back in her next life, she wants to come back as Max Falkenstein. Because it is a good deal, I always have a great seat. And a good seat it's been. He's seen more than half of Kansas's 1,010 football games and over half of the men's basketball victories. Oh, there's some tough parts to it. Uh, talking to a coach right after a loss, that's a tough situation because their emotions are right on their sleeves and oftentimes I'm the first guy that they talk to. But you get to revel with them on the great victories too, so that makes it all worthwhile. And he's talked to most of them. He's been through nine head coaches, seven bowl games, four conference affiliations, 10 athletic directors, and an estimated 1,600 game broadcast hours. That's a good statistic in their favor. Gosh, uh, when I started, we didn't have any statistics. We didn't even think of keeping individual statistics as the game wore along in those days, you know, and at the end of the game, you just got a wrap up of, of the whole uh, picture. In his 50 years of broadcasting, he's never missed a football broadcast and only two or three basketball games. Each game is not a life event uh, as it is if you're the head coach. I mean, I've seen lots of losses. I've seen an 0-10 football season, and I've seen great bowl games and uh, Final Fours and uh, many, many disappointments along the way. So I still get up the next day and go play golf. You know, it's not the end of the world. Uh, either way, win or lose. It is an odd thing, these sporting events, the partisan crowds, the players, all hoping to be tomorrow's headline, and Max up there in the booth trying to play both sides with verbal ease. They have a very potent offense to... No, I don't perceive myself as a cheerleader at all. I don't, I don't really believe in that as a broadcaster. I've always tried to, to give credit to the other team when they have an outstanding play or players. As KU fans know, because they depend on his insight and integrity to tell it like it is. He'll be there, Mike side, win or lose. I intend to stay at it for a little while longer. And I guess when the time comes that I don't enjoy it anymore or feel like uh, I'm not doing a good job, that'll be the time to quit. Max kept doing the games, the Jayhawk games, for another 10 years. 
finally retiring in 2006. Let's see, 50 plus 10, 60 yeah. years? Forever, forever. It's amazing. And he did it forever because he did a great job. Mm -hmm. And up until that time, he had broadcast every men's basketball game ever played, ever played, ever played. in Allen Fieldhouse. Well, he just recently passed away in 2019 at age 95. And KU football and basketball fans will know the name in a second when you say should, Max's should, name. Should we rename Allen Fieldhouse Falkelstein Fieldhouse? Well, maybe so. We should propose that, shouldn't yeah, we, we should, Larry? Yeah. Wonder how far <laughs> we'd get. <laughs> You've probably heard the saying that no news is good news. Well, just how true that is depends on the context. Well, it's certainly not good if you are talking about the fate of many small town newspapers. They've played, though, such an important role in community life through the decades, and now so many have gone by the wayside. But when the paper in Douglas, Kansas, faced an uncertain fate in 1984, a 21-year-old named Carmen Meyer stepped up and took over. If I was given a tour, what spots would I pick out? Right. Community building, very important. At 21, Carmen Meyer doesn't look like a tough, grizzled newspaper editor, but she is, and Cassandra Castor is her only staff member. Together, they publish the Douglas, Kansas Tribune. It's, it's a great town, it's your hometown. You know, so it doesn't matter how bad, you know, you might see them, something, it's still home. Carmen purchased her hometown paper two months ago. Since then, she and Cassandra have learned a lot about the newspaper business. <sighs> what a neat thing. Being 21, being the editor of a paper, and you've got the say over it, even though it's just a little paper, it's terrific. Okay, let's see, Chris's row, what did you come up with? The Tribune covers stories the larger papers ignore. Here, Carmen's job is to photograph a group of students about to name their class mascot, a clock in the form of a clown. People ask, why are you doing this? You know, you don't make any money off of it, and you're young, you know, you're finishing school and everything. But if you enjoy what you're doing, you know, and we're having fun with it. Really? Why did you guys like Bozo? Oh, we got a picture of Bozo. The heart and soul of any community is reflected in its people, and the eyes of this city are watching the Tribune's new owners. And you have to stay in the middle of everything, and you have to watch what you say to who, you know, about someone else. Man, it gets around fast. In Spain, I, I went to a school. This foreign exchange student just arrived in Douglas from Spain, and because Cassandra Castor is the only member of the Tribune's reporting staff, she's learning valuable journalistic lessons aren't always taught in school. I never realized that the Tribune, the paper, meant that much to so many people. I knew it existed and I knew that the community relied on it, but never to the extent that some people, you know, take it now. If they don't get their paper on Wednesday, they're just, they're in complete panic. So from this tiny corporate office, the weekly deadlines are met. A successful season or winning? Developing a successful... That winning tradition. Right. Small town weeklies are the voice of the people, and it's here that grassroots journalism occupies an important part in the life of this community. I didn't take over the paper to get even with anybody, you know, yeah. there's no, <laughs> nothing like that. So uh, I'm taking it because I see some changes that can be made and I had the chance. In the newspaper business, some have goals to move to larger papers. Oh, so. Does Carmen? Who knows what we're going to be doing a few months from now, let alone 25, 30 years. You, I can even be married, and you can even have kids. No. Well, yeah. none of us know what the future will bring. For right now, though, Carmen Meyer and Cassandra Castor are happy well right where they are, giving a part of themselves back to their community through the pages of the Douglas Tribune. This is Laurie Hennebrun. Qualities and those that go into making. It was an exciting opportunity while it lasted, but the economics, well, they just weren't there. And like so many small town newspapers, the Douglas Tribune closed down several years ago, and Carmen and her assistant had to move on to other things. And you know, that's too bad because uh -huh. they were really invested, not only monetarily, but really invested in the community. In the community. If my memory serves me right, they were both from there. And so they knew the community. And when you have people in the community running the newspaper who know what's going on and know how that community works, that is so vital and so important.
Can I get on my soapbox for sure. a little? Go for when it. you have community people running local media, yeah. no matter whether it's radio or television or newspaper especially, you're going to get quality that is quality in the community and dedicated to the community. Unfortunately, we don't have that anymore in hardly any city in America. I'm glad Susan got on her soapbox <laughs> because I agree with her 100%. Yeah. And it is, it is, if all local media could be owned locally, things would be a lot different. It used to be that way. It did. Go ahead, Larry. <laughs> all right. Well, just by watching this next story, you'd have a hard time guessing what year, decade, or even century it's from. It's actually from 1985, but Rudolph and Rose Oberney didn't much care about what the calendar said, and they had no interest in changing with the times. <laughs> Eighty-one-year-old Rudolph Oberney doesn't care if the rest of the world believes the accordion is a dying instrument. To him, it's music from his soul. Rudolph and his wife live on a farm near Reich Center. His music is a constant to the countryside. So many youngsters, you know, they don't hear good music to get accustomed to it. You get accustomed to certain music. And if you listen to good music, you'll, you'll get to like it, you'll want it. But uh, some of this music is so rotten that I, I run away from it. Rudolph's wife, Rosie, has spent decades quietly listening as her husband, lost in his own musical world, played a concert for one. on my own and I'm concentrating what I'm doing to do it as best as I can and it, that's what he takes. He began playing the accordion when he was 16. His Czechoslovakian parents instilled a passion for music that still burns today. Mother was a great singer. She always sang songs and learned us them old words to them old time songs and it was beautiful. Along the way he saved many old accordions from the junk pile and to him junk is modern music. Oh, no, I ain't for that at all. This uh, jitterbug or this here, uh, that, that to me is rotten. Rural America is a blend of ethnic music that is personified in people like Rudolph Oberney. His music spans generations when life was simpler, when times were slower, and music was the opium of the spirit. Now, melodies like these are written on the wind, a wind that is slowly blowing itself out. Just wonderful, you know, it's a wonderful pastime and it builds you up and I'd hate to lose it. Rudolph and his kin performed together as the Oberney family band. They played all across Kansas up until the late 1950s. Now, Rudolph lived to be 92. Rosie, she lived to be 91. You know, when you meet people like that, they're just real people who enjoy what they're doing and they other people enjoy it. What could be better? What could be better? Yeah. And no doubt people like that and their kin playing in heaven. I'm sure they are. Don't you think, Larry? They're playing I, to the angels. I think so. <laughs> uh, the importance of knowing history, of course, is undeniable, but getting people interested isn't always so easy. Now, out in Wichita County in far western Kansas, Karen Walk knew there was a valuable history to be shared, but the challenge was how to turn it into something that would attract visitors. This was the situation in 2002. The building is, was built as a WPA building. We think it's a pretty nice building. Pretty, it made a wonderful museum. Well, I just think it's a wonderful history of Wichita County. I think there's a lot of nice things in here and 
memories for people and, and things for the young people to see. The, the school children just love it. They come and they, they really are, are very interested. Director Karen Walk is proud of her Wichita County Museum in Leota. Come on out and we'll show you. <laughs> but 10 miles west of town in Selkirk, the museum has acquired what may be the only hand dug railroad well in existence. This well was dug by the Santa Fe Railroad in 1887. Uh, it's 102 feet deep and 24 feet in diameter. For perspective, the well is as deep as this adjacent grain elevator is tall. The steam pump pumped the water out to a pump house which had a pump in it and on up into the uh, into the big water tank. Karen and her board hope to put a glass elevator down to the bottom of the well and on top a complete tourist facility to accompany this depot currently under renovation. I think we have to do it big in order to to get people to come out to western Kansas in order to advertise it big it is going to have to be a, a big thing so it, we would like to make it into like a railroad theme park. They are hoping for grant money to make it all possible. We just feel like it could be a really a big thing for western Kansas. Museums like this one in Leota all hope for the same thing money and visitors to help save the history of the people of Kansas. 18 years later, Karen says the museum is still a prized jewel, and plans are now in the works to move the old depot 10 miles from Selkirk into Leote. That's next to the museum. But unfortunately, plans to develop the historic well into a tourist destination never came to fruition. Karen says she tried. They applied for countless grants and other funding, but she said she just struck out as it is now, but you never know about the future. Yeah, and this is being recorded, as we say, during COVID times, so getting money for museums and other public things, it's very, very difficult, but a local person's involved, and we hope and we wish her well in the future that she can get that funding. Mm -hmm. The roadside fruit stand has long been a staple of the Kansas countryside. There is no better place to buy fresh, locally grown produce. And a lot of people will tell you that back in the day, there was no better fruit stand than Johnny's, and that's just west of Newton. When you're nice to people, they're nice to you. The public just don't understand. All it takes just to be nice, just wave at somebody. Johnny Jackson has been waving at friends for years. Those are real sweet candles. Yeah. He owns Johnny's I'm Fruit Stand on Highway 50 west of Newton. I've retired nine times. If I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't be doing it. Did you say you wanted 100 boxes of those? <laughs> Watch them rattle, boy, they're going to get upset. <laughs> In his little fruit stand, you'll find tomatoes, sauces, candy, mustard, peanuts, maple syrup, mixed nuts, and a book on Highway 50. You just said it. But we're not done yet, folks. A picture of KFDI's Johnny Western, beef, jerky, and of course, Johnny. So I borrowed $100 from my stepdad, and I opened up Johnny's fruit stand. That was years ago in Oklahoma. Now, his Highway 50 location in Kansas is both legend and reality. Yeah, they're juicy. When they get right, they're juicy. I'm glad to hear you say that. And if you're there very long, he'll tell you how an old Jewish man once gave him the key to success. He taught me, Johnny, be good to your people. Love them. They will keep you going. <laughs> He's never forgotten that, and his no, sly wit kidding. and understated humor makes the locals feel good. My stepdad put a sign, taters, maters, and stuff. <laughs> oh, I love that thing, huh? He's always giving folks <laughs> stuff. Now, no one Take asks care, for it. So where are you going to now? That's just Johnny's way. Are you? It's more than a fruit stand. <laughs> Get in here right now. <laughs> Where do I know you from? It's a place where life's okay, little where lessons do? are simple. Huh? Be nice, I, I and know folks you, I? will be nice back. That's it. Oh, boy. Yeah, meat inspection. Johnny ran his fruit stand for nearly 25 years. And after he died in 2005, the building housed a number of different businesses, none of which had much success. But 
The success was, and the success today, is remembering Johnny. I wish it was still there. Wouldn't it be fun to go buy it would. local fruit and vegetables? We can go buy in our mind. There you go. <laughs> and through Hatterberg's videos. That's true. <laughs> Well, the clock is ticking for all of us. Time is a one-way road that leads to the great unknown. Boy, that's deep stuff. Isn't it? <laughs> I, I hate that, don't you? That's, that's, I'm scared now. I know. It's the deep unknown. All right, well, D.D. D. Hall of Sterling always knew what time it was, and he was an expert at both the journey and the destination. There is a coldness in the tick of a clock. With each sound, time moves us closer to our destiny, closer to our fate, closer to our maker. Time is important. Now, you only got one chance. And if you don't make use of it, why, it's too bad. Dee Dee Hall of Sterling, Kansas has time, plenty of time. It's, a, it's an old style, says Thomas, and I suppose it's, it's 100 years old. Mr. Hall fixes clocks, a clock dock, you might say. Actually, it relaxes me. Athletic shoes on and acting like a preacher. Dee Dee Hall has timed his life to perfection. In this church, he is Pastor Dee Dee Hall. He's been that for 48 years. Here I'm saving souls, and at the shop I'm saving clocks, I'm saving time. Here he tries to reach his congregation before their time runs out. And uh, of course, the only thing to preach is, is the Bible. That's all there is left to preach. Years ago, Pastor Hall took up clock repair to supplement his income. Pastoring a small church took time, but in many of his churches, time wasn't money. Like this old clock here, uh, time means nothing to it. And yet, if I get the pieces in it right, it'll keep perfect time. That's the way it is in life. If you, uh, if you miss a minute or two while it's gone, a day, a day is wasted and it'll, and it'll never come back. Pastor Hall travels the area fixing broken ticks that won't talk. And on Sunday, telling his congregation time is not on their side. It takes patience. Around his cluttered shop are time's guts, springs and gears gone bad that few of us understand. I've worked on over 6,000 watches in this, in this community. Uh, I haven't kept track of my clocks. And his wife knows the power of this little place. She said time means nothing to you when you, when you get up to shop. You just soon work till six as you would come home at five. I wanted this. Dee Dee's time on earth ran out in 2007. He was 90 years old. Meanwhile, the message of his life was timeless and one for all of us to ponder. Well, time has run out for this show, but we'll have more stories for you next time. And remember, if you have a question or a comment, Hatterberg's people at kpts.org is our email address, and we do enjoy hearing from you. Until next time, I'm Larry Hatterberg. I'm Susan Peters. We hope you enjoyed all these classic stories about Kansans through the decades. I sure did. I love it. <laughs> it's so historical. It's fun. It's the best of Hatterberg's people. Exactly right, Susie. Thank you so exactly much, right. Larry. Thank all you. All right, everybody. We will see you again soon.